Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to start by explaining what tissue engineering is before going on to give a couple of examples on tissue engineered organs. So what is tissue engineering? Tissue engineering is a multidisciplinary field that brings together cell biologists, developmental biologists, material scientists, bioengineers and clinicians, all with the aim of creating functional tissue. That functional tissue is then used for the four R's, which is basically repair, restore, replace and regenerate non-functional or diseased tissue. <coughs> there is a growing clinical need for um, tissue that has been produced outside of the body, that's tissue engineered. And this is for, to replace tissues that have resulted from injuries, for example, either sport injuries, um, anterior cruciate ligaments, um, trauma, disease, a congenital defect, for example, a trochlear atresia in a paediatric case, and also for end-stage organ failure. From the previous speakers, we know that there is a significant and substantial shortage for, for donors, and that if we look at the kidney, bowel, and liver as an example, what we see is that for the kidney, there are approximately 7,000 patients on a waiting list, and the med wait, median waiting time is three years. If we look at the bowel, fewer transplants are done. One of the reasons is, of, is due to the um, immunosuppressive drugs that are used and the complications arising from that. But if we look at the cost of keeping patients who would benefit from a transplant, if it was possible, that's quite high. If we look at the, li the liver, we can also see that although the success is great, again, there is a donor sh shortage. The idea behind tissue engineering organs is to produce organs to actually circumvent not only the shortage, but also perhaps circumvent the need for strong immunosuppressive drugs. The basic requirements for a tissue, engineer, tissue engineered organs requires three basic principles. You need your cells, you need a scaffold, and you need the right environment. Your cells can be either stem cells, they can be taken from a bone marrow, they can be taken from a biopsy, for example, from um, the trachea. Your scaffold can be either synthetic, that's man-made, or it can be biological. That biological scaffold can come from a human or it can come from a pig. Those two elements need to be put together in the right environment to increase the possibility of getting functional tissue for an organ. As we know, all cells are not created equal, and the possible sources for cells include autologous and differentiated, allogeneic, and adult stem cells or progenitor cells, or embryonic stem cells. All of these cells can be combined together with a scaffold to produce functional tissue. However, depending on where you want to put that functional tissue at the end will determine whether you, want to, you will end up using strong immunosuppressive drugs or not. And for those of you who perhaps don't quite understand the terms, an autologous is your own, allogeneic is from the same species. If we look at synthetic scaffolds, the majority of synthetic scaffolds have a common polymer backbone, and they're known as either a PLA, PGLA, or PGA, it's a polyglycolic um, backbone. The advantages in, in using a synthetic scaffold is that they're reproducer, reproducible on a large scale. They're very cheap to, to make. You can customise them. You can control about just about any single element of that scaffold, whether it's its strength, its porosity, its degradation rate, and its microstructure. However, there is a slight advantage in that these scaffolds are often inert, so they don't have the ability to cross-talk with the cells. The ability for cells to cross-talk with the scaffold is crucial because this will determine how the cells attach onto that scaffold and how they then proliferate. If we turn our attention to biological scaffolds, there are two main groups. One are scaffolds that have been made using biologically derived material, that's collagen <coughs> and alginate. Alginate is basically seaweed. Or those that have used, um, or those, sorry, that are known as acellular biological matrices. The difference here is that these have used a pre existing piece of tissue. They've taken that tissue and turned it back into a scaffold. And the way that's been achieved is by using a process called decellarization. And what that basically does is that you take detergent, and it could basically be your washing up liquid, and you wash your tissue with it. What that does is that it removes all the cells, the nuclear material within those cells, and the molecules on the surface that help um, in recognising that cell. What's left behind is a matrices or a scaffold. 
A simple analogy is that if you take a brick house, all brick houses come in lots of different shapes and sizes. If you carefully remove all the bricks from the house, what you're left behind with is a cement framework. You could then take cells or bricks from a different house and implant them back into that house and get a functioning house again. That's a very simple way of looking at it. When we do this for tissues, what we have is that we've taken all the cells out and we're left behind with an ECM or an extracellular matrix. That extracellular matrix is made up of collagen and elastin and the proteins that are left on it on the collagen which help with the crosstalk. One unique advantage of collagen is that it's preserved between species, meaning that you can take it from a pig and put it into a human, you can take it from one individual and put it into another individual without the use of strong immunosuppressive drugs. And this is what is very exciting when it comes to tissue engineering organs, but these, because these will constitute the basic scaffolds. The year 2008 was very exciting in the, t in the field of tissue engineering for a number of reasons. The first one was that there was a report that a tissue engineer, Takir, had been engineered in the laboratory and had been implanted into a patient with good clinical outcome. What they basically did was the team took a piece of trachea from a human cadaver, they took it back into the lab and used a series of detergents to wash out all the cells and they were left behind with the cartilage scaffold that makes up the trachea. They then took cells from the patient for who the scaffold was intended. They took epithelial cells and her mesenchymal stem cells, so basically the bone marrow. They then put the scaffold together with the cells in a bioreactor. A bioreactor is simply a, a tissue incubator, really. And waited until there was enough cells having attached onto the scaffold. That scaffold was then implanted back into the patient from where the cells originally originated from. The patient so far is doing well. And the major advantage over this type of transplantation for co over conventional transplantation is that she doesn't require any strong immunosuppressive dr drugs because the cells in that scaffold are hers, nor is she likely to reject that scaffold. The second um, exciting piece of information came out of Professor Doris Taylor's lab at the University of Minnesota. They were interested in tissue engineering a heart. What they did was that they took a rat heart and again perfused detergents into the heart. The difference between this type of perfusion and that used previously for the trachea was that the pre previously the trachea had been simply put into a bath and just washed with detergents. What this group did was that they used the intrinsic vasculature of the heart to deliver the detergent. So they used the coronary arteries and delivered the detergents deep into the tissue. This technique is not only more efficient, it's quicker. The quicker you can decelerize your scaffold, the less likely you are to damage that scaffold as well. And here you can see images of um, a rat, the rat heart as it's slowly being decelerized. Here there's a little bit of the cells are still remaining and as they're washed out, finally you're left with this, what she, what she calls her ghost heart. And basically it's the heart and, and this is just basically collagen and elastin. The next step was actually to see if they could reseed the heart. It's all very well having a scaffold, but you've got to produce a piece of functional tissue. So what, what they did was that they took cardiomyocytes, cardiomyocytes from neonatal <coughs> rats and injected them back into the heart. And four days later, they got macroscopic contraction. Okay, this is a rat heart, it's very exciting. But the next step was actually to take that one scale further. And, I, and so to date, she's actually managed to decelerize both a pig heart and a human heart. In our laboratory, we've been interested in tissue engineering small intestines. We started a couple of years ago looking at uh, what we could do to help with the sh shortage um, of tissue required for patients who have short bowel syndrome. These are patients that have less than 70 centimeters of their bowel. So often they are fed parenterally, that means they're fed through a tube. What we did was we took pieces of rat colon and we decelerize them using, again, detergents and produce a scaffold. And this is the scaffold that you see. This is a histological image. So this is um, a section that has also been stained so you can see the collagen. This is the lumen and this is the outer edge. And the pink stain is all the collagen. 
for some of you may, able, may be able to see the fine villi that will actually protrude into the lumen of the scaffold. Now it's quite important that when you decelerize your scaffolds that you try and maintain the integrity of that tissue as much as possible. Having produced a scaffold, we then wanted to see the scaffold with cells and we chose organoid units. Organoid units are basically clusters of cells that you get from the crypts of your villi, um, the villi which is the, um, the luminal aspect of your intestine. We broke that up using collagenases to get these little clumps. Now the clumps are made up of an outer epithelial layer and an inner mesenchymal core. And basically the mesenchymal core is the bit that contains the stem cells. We put the cells together with the scaffold and implanted it into a rat. It wasn't implanted in a functional position. Basically we created little sausages about one centimetre and then filled them with the organoid units and then implanted under them under the skin in a rat. The idea was to see whether the cells would attach to the scaffold. Six weeks later, when we looked at, when we explanted at the tissue, this is what we saw. We saw tissue that resembles pretty much normal intestinal tissue. So this is neo-intestinal tissue. And you can see here um, the, the crypts that you would normally see. You can there and there, and you've got the submucosa. And interestingly, there are, you can, there's small blood vessels. All the cells that are normally found in a normal piece of tissue were present in that piece of neurointestinal um, tissue engineered tissue. It's all very well producing a small piece of tissue about one centimeter long, but it's not going to really do you much use, give you much use in a clinical setting. So we scaled up. What we did was that we took 30 centimeters of porcine small intestine, primarily because it's similar in size to human. And we use the vasculature which supplies the intestine to actually decelerize it. So we chose the, a feeding artery and a feeding vein and we um, fused it with detergents. 48 hours later, we ended up with a scaffold. This scaffold is exactly the same as the rat colon that we had produced earlier, only difference is is that it now has the vascular arcade attached with it. We wanted to know if the scaffold we had produced would have the structural integrity when, if we were to attach it and perfuse blood to it. So we took, in a separate animal, in a pig, we removed the kidney and we attached this scaffold to that kidney and perfused blood into it. And what you can see is that the integrity of this scaffold has been maintained and these are the fine blood vessels overlying the, the bowel tissue. We've also managed to do the same using large intestinal tissue to create a clonic patch. This is a piece of pig colon, which has been decelerized, and when implanted in, again, you can see that the vasculature is intact. Maintaining the vasculature is going to be important because this is the route we're going to use if we are, when we reseed this scaffold. Other organs which also show promise include the the bladder, Atala and his group have shown that it's possible to take biopsies from bladders and then <coughs> using a tissue engineered um, construct to create a, a semi-functional a bladder. Liver, two groups have also shown that it's possible to decelerize um, a rat and a ferret liver and then seed that again with hepatocytes and endothelial cells to get some sort of biliary function. And the lungs are and his group has shown that it's possible to take rat lung, decelerize the entire lung, see it again with epithelial cells, and, and show that it is possible to maintain the gas exchange surface area. So what have we said so far? A tissue engineered organ it's, to date is one that is being customized, is a customized piece of tissue which is grown in the lab. We've, shown, we've had significant success with very simple structures, which are tubular, for example, the trachea, but more complex organs, for example, the heart and bladder and liver, present a greater challenge.